Welcome everyone. I hope that everybody can hear me and our te technical difficulties are over with. This is um, a learning curve, I think, for, for me and I know for Kathy as well. Thank you again for joining. So today um, we are going to have an introduction to the Enneagram. And some of you may be familiar with the Enneagram, but we're going to talk about the Enneagram in its relationship to helping people in recovery and, um, and uh, how it's beneficial in the addictions and treatment world. Uh, if anybody is having any troubles, please make sure that you um, type in the chat and Kathy can help uh, uh, get uh, any of those things corrected. So we're going to move right into the PowerPoint and um, we'll have time for questions and answers uh, after the webinar is over with. So here we go. Um, let's see here. I just got my video and do the screen share. So, if there are any questions that people have, um, you can reach me at my email on the um, bottom of this introductory slide. So the, the question is, is this you? Is something holding your clients back and you don't know what it is? With all of your training, are you continually questioning your own skills while you're working with those in recovery? Are you frustrated with the recovery success rate of your clients? And would you like to improve your recovery success rate? My hunch is if you've signed on for the webinar, one or more of those things are things that you would like, that you identify with. So the benefits of knowing the Enneagram are that more of your clients will recover than ever before. Your client success rate will dramatically increase. You'll have the confidence to deal with even the most difficult and challenging clients. You'll know what to do to support your clients in the ways that will make the greatest differences to them. And you're going to be given a tool to deal with resistance and denial that so often come up in recovery. We're going to cover today uh, what the Enneagram is why learning about the Enneagram holds value to those that I and you serve impacted by addictions. Um, when I say impacted by addictions, you'll see several references throughout these slides to not just the people in recovery, but family members as well. How does the Enneagram differ from other personality assessments and how much bigger than a typical personality assessment it is? We're gonna briefly go over what the nine types are and how and where you can learn more after the webinar today. So why do I do this? It is a game changer. It had, when I was introduced to the Enneagram, it had an impact on my practice and the increase in recovery for everybody, family members included, that was impacted by addictions, including family members. And as a family member in recovery myself, I can tell you that both personally and professionally, it had an incredible impact on me. Family members can also become more refreshed and re-engaged in loving relationships and find ways to heal the broken trust that has been so often a part of addiction's work. So what's the meaning of this strange word called Enneagram? It's a Greek word and it means a diagram of nine. The um, map of the Enneagram is what is referred to as the Enneagram. The study of the Enneagram is a study of these uh, nine types that we're gonna talk about. Ennea means nine in Greek and gram is the reference to a diagram. So some there, you know, there's a lot of a debate about how and where the Enneagram, um, you know, came from and um, 
a lot of belief that it came from spiritual roots in all of the ancient wisdom traditions that have turned into our major world religions. There's documentation that it has strong Sufi roots and uh, connections to early esoteric Christianity or the Desert Father traditions as, as it's known. So this is the Enneagram. This diagram is the Enneagram and I really love using this particular uh, map and description because although it um, describes the nine types, it also is a diagram that um, shows the triads, the three groups of three. We're going to go into a bit more about these three groups of three, but this particular diagram shows the body types, the heart types, and the head types. So within Enneagram training uh, is this notion that we have three centers of intelligence or three ways of knowing. Uh, about life, the world, three ways of getting information through the body, the heart, and the head. So that is the reason that I like this diagram. I also like it because although we're not going to go into the arrows and wings in this training, it also has a reference to the points that sit on either side of a point, which are known as wings, and the arrows, which describe places where people move in times of stress and in times of relaxation in their uh, personality or their strategy for managing life. And I'm going to use the words character structure, strategy for maintaining life, and personality as interchangeable words uh, throughout this um, workshop today. So it refers to a diagram, like I said, a system of nine personality types or character structures, the styles of being a person, and in a larger way, these structures, these character structures are ways to survive and defend ourselves, which we would probably describe in, in many ways as personality. It also has a, because of its spiritual underpinnings, describes this, the greatest capacities that we have, which are the essential qualities that we have when we each come into being, to the greatest challenges that we encounter. And our virtues are what we're going to call our universal qualities of consciousness, or what some might call divine qualities. And our vices are our human experience. The journey of awakening to more than personality, or what lies beneath it, is the journey from uh, about loosening character structure or personality and softening that experience and uh, actually obtaining some uh, relationship to our, to our essence, which is our, those divine qualities and virtues. So what is the value uh, of this Enneagram when we look at coaching and counseling? Well, it's very self-empowering, and we know that in coaching, that's a principle. In counseling, it has become a principle. You know, the more empowered people are, the greater they, are, uh, feel, the greater they have been able to move from a sense of victimhood uh, into making uh, life-sustaining changes. As a coaching competency, we would look at the value as creating awareness, um, certainly in counseling as well. And it allows for movement within the stages of change. You can work with anyone at any stage of change, whether they're in a pre-contemplative stage of change or an action or maintenance stage of change. Um, it's aligned with counseling evidence-based uh, practices of motivational interviewing, meeting people where they're at, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, because we are going to be looking at the cognitive or thinking aspects of a person, the emotive or emotional aspects of a person, and the behavioral or reactive aspects of a person. It can be used in early and later phases of addictions treatment. It's useful with co-occurring disorders at the onset of treatment. And the greatest value that is not listed on uh, this list here is that it allows each provider, whether you're a practitioner that's a coach or a counselor, it allows you to take a look at your own bias 
that you come into treatment provision with or, or managing and or partnering with a, a client in session. So often we're given principles in our uh, practices as coaches and counselors of you know what an evidence-based best practice is or the newest hottest method. Uh, the Enneagram uh, has this tried and true um, ability to, if you use the practices related to the Enneagram, uh, allow yourself to see your own clinician or provider bias and how walking into that relationship, you have both assets and challenges as you move to partner with clients in making change. And the Enneagram is an integrated tool. Um, if you noticed, I have a boatload of initials after my name, and I am clearly passionate about trying to help people figure out why they do what they do. And so because we have this aspect of looking at the somatic experience of type, we can take a look at physical uh, concerns associated with each type. When I say physical, I it can be anything from a disease in the body to a visceral experience to trauma um, to an em embodiment uh, of a practice. Uh, it has a cognitive emotional experience that's associated with each type. So each type has a thought pattern and an emotional feeling pattern. And there are spiritual principles that have been forgotten by each typology, which is what I was referencing when I said it comes from a spiritual tradition where these essential qualities of consciousness um, are associated with each type. So assessment, really important. We have ways of looking at typology and assessing typology. And before we go into what they might be and how you might access them, it's important to notice that the journey to discerning type and, and each person has only one type throughout their life. The journey to discerning type is just as important as landing on type. So whether you take this READY, which is a uh, acronym for the abbreviated complementary assessment available through the Enneagram Institute, or the narrative tradition paragraph assessment, which is associated with the Enneagram worldwide tradition, or go online to eclecticenergies.com, and you can take the Enneagram test two with instinctual variance. You, even if you land on something different in each one of these assessments, just narrowing down what types you are not allows you through this assessment process to begin to raise your awareness about who you are, what you do and who you are and why you behave in the way that you do. So I just uh, encourage people particularly those who are new to the Enneagram, to note that the journey to discerning type is every bit as important as landing on type. So um, going back to that initial diagram, we have three ways of knowing. We have these centers of intelligence, these ways of knowing through the body types, uh, the instinctual body types, the eights, nines, and ones, and you'll see that they're referenced in red throughout um, the PowerPoint here because they are governed by dealing with fear by covering it with anger. The emotional types or our feeling types are going to be referenced in green and they are types two, three, and four. And they're going to be referenced by the uh, way of coping with fear by shame showing up. And our thinking centers referenced in blue are five, sixes, and sevens um, as dealing with fear is straight, straight on fear. So fear shows up. We have two basic emotions. We have love and fear. And fear shows up in our body types as being covered by anger in our feeling types as being covered with shame or distress, 
and in our thinking types as being uh, straight on fear as we would recognize it. And so you'll, you'll see this referencing. Now we have three basic needs as children that go unmet in which personality um, is, it develops. And these three needs are a need to be heard, a need to be seen, and a need to feel safe. And the need to be heard is one that kind of comes up into the forefront in the instinctual body types as personality develops. The need to be seen is the um, unmet childhood need that seems to surface as primary uh, around which type two, three, and fours develop personality. And the need to feel safe uh, emerges at the forefront for five, sixes, and sevens as their personality develops. That being said, we all have each one of these unmet childhood needs that are absolutely important uh, in our lives. And these needs are all present at all times, but one of them emerges in the forefront around pers uh, which personality is woven and where our type actually shows up. So we're going to start out by looking at these body-based instinctual types that deal with fear showing up in their life with anger um, being the, the prevalent means uh, of how, uh, how fear shows up. Our body-based type, they lead with an instinctual uh, way of knowing. They lead with uh, the body for movement, sensate awareness, or what we would call gut-level feelings. Uh, and these gut-level feelings create uh, a sense of personal security and social belonging. Their focus is on being in control of themselves and their environment and taking action in practical ways. And so the need for power and control as a result of not being uh, heard is how the eights, nines, and ones show up. And our feeling centers, our feeling-based types emphasize their, uh, they rely on the heart for a positive and negative feeling and for empathy and concern for, for others and are focused on romance and devotion. Their focus is on image, success, relationship, and performing up to the expectations of the job or of other people. And those are our twos, threes, and fours. And we are gonna go into each one of these types in more detail. Our thinking or intellectual centers, uh, they're uh, the thinking-based types. They lead with ideas, perception, rational thinking. They emphasize the gathering of information and figuring things out before acting. And their focus is on creating certainty and safety or finding multiple options. And we'll see that as we look at our fives, sixes, and sevens. So let's take, take a look at the um, Enneagram again. This is another diagram. So we have nine forms or structures. These are patterned in which attention is organized. So attention is organized differently at each one of these points. Each one of the points has a different pattern of thinking, feeling, and acting. Each one of the points has characteristics and habitual behaviors that kind of just run on kind of uh, autopilot. And each uh, type also has a distinct lens, defense mechanism, set of worldviews, perceptions that they move into um, the world with. So here's our colorful personality. These, our personality are these nine types that have distinct patterns or themes by which people operate or focus their attention to meet the challenges of living and growing in the world. A way of expressing yourself in the world. And I also like to think about this as a strategy for which each type has, has um, kind of decided to manage the world. And that's what personality is. So our dimensions for using the Enneagram is that it integrates this body, mind, and spiritual aspect of each one of the types. 
It provides a framework for different types of intelligence, looking at body, head, and heart. It views personality types as equal with strengths and potentials, as well as areas for development. There is not one type that is any more or less healthy than another. And it allows for addressing the core motivations for behaviors, emotions, and thoughts. And this is where the Enneagram differs so much from other personality systems, because you could take a look at the Myers-Briggs or the DISC, things like that, but not one of them really allows us to take a look at core motivations. And I'm gonna give you an example of that. If I were to just ask all of you, how important is it for you to be a good person or is it important for you to be a good person? The majority of everybody you know, that's listening would say, of course it's important to be a good person. But if I were to ask you to distinguish why it's important for you to be a good person, we would find very differing responses to that because our core motivations might be something like, well, I, you know, that's what I was taught by my parents. Or if I'm not a good person, then bad things will happen to me. Or, you know, I might not go to heaven if I'm not a good person. Or, you know, well, why wouldn't everybody on the planet not want to be a good person? That's just, it's not even within my frame of reference to think about that. So we look at core motivations as being a very distinct aspect for why the Enneagram is different, besides the fact that it emerged from spiritual principles a long time ago, uh, as being different from like core personality assessments. So we're gonna take a, a tour of the types in terms of taking a look at human brain development and where this becomes pertinent in our journey is that instead of starting chronologically with type one, we're gonna start with type eight and go around the Enneagram diagram. And the reason we're gonna start with type eight is because if we take a look at brain development, our enteric brain or the gastrula that's first apparent when you look at a fetus in utero is where the first aspect of the human being uh, emerges. Our gastrula and a spinal cord is the first thing that we see in a sonogram, indicating that as our body or the first part of our brain develops in utero, our instinctual intelligence or our sensate intelligence is what develops first. So the body type issues um, are the very, very first to develop in the enteric brain. That doesn't mean that that will be what your personality is developed around, as you see, you know, we, if we only have one type, not everybody is an eight, nine, or one. Uh, the next part of the brain to develop in utero is the limbic brain, which sits on top of the spinal cord, and we, those are correlated to the heart types, and the head types are the last piece of our brain development, which is our prefrontal cortex, and they're related to types five, sixes, and sevens. And in uh, it, more advanced training or in trainings that are going to be offered at the end of this um, workshop today, you'll, you'll see why um, that becomes really important. Um, before we go on, I do want to say in terms of making correlations to um, your, the people that you serve, when you have a client who is functioning and leading through their instinctual intelligence, the types of interventions that you would use to work with them are going to look very different than people who are leading with their heart level of intelligence or people who are just uh, functioning with the facts and the facts become uh, predominant. Engaging in, uh, in, in a treatment relationship and understanding what you bring into that relationship as well as the person sitting across from you is absolutely essential. Not so much in developing rapport, although that's clearly helpful, but certainly in terms of helping them make change and suggesting the most appropriate actions to move forward. So we're gonna start with our type um, eight, and as I said, we're going to go through eights, nines, and ones, then twos, threes, and fours, and five, sixes, and sevens. So you'll see the reference to uh, type eight as a body, the first type in the body center triad. 
The um, Enneagram has schoolings in lots of different areas, and we have various names up here to take a look at our eights. They can be known as the protector, the boss, the maverick, the entrepreneur, and maybe even other names. And our eights have a belief that you must be strong and powerful to assure protection and regard in a very tough world. Consequently, our protectors, they, they seek justice, they're direct, they're strong, they're action-oriented, they can be overly impactful, excessive, and impulsive. And one of my favorite things that I love to add when I talk about type eights is uh, my mentor and uh, biggest Enneagram teacher, Dr. David Daniels, um, who's now deceased but was a uh, Stanford psychiatrist who had the courage to bring the Enneagram into the Department of Psychiatry at Stanford in the early to mid 80s, describes these um, type eights as over exuberant children who have really lost their sense of how powerful this lustful platform of energy is. And so let's just take a look at type eight now in terms of what would happen if you knew you had a type eight. So uh, after running a treatment uh, center for many, many years and having type eights come in, especially working with gambling, because we had, if you look at the uh, gambling addiction kind of stereotype of 20, 25 years ago, it was typically a middle-aged male who was an action gambler and may have had kind of a criminal uh, gangsta kind of uh, 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 presentation, may have even had a personality disorder, um, but sitting across from the typical treatment provider who is uh, probably a, a young to middle-aged female, uh, this type could be very in intimidating. And this type also, uh, type eights, do not like people who, or believe in people who cannot stand toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe with them and be very, very direct. So knowing that about who you are and what type you are and how you walk into treatment with type eights is, is, is crucial. Um, or walk into sessions with type eights if we're talking about coaching. coaching. So please bear with me as I use coaching and counseling uh, kind of interchangeable um, uh, words. Our second type in our body center, type nine, is known as the, PD, uh, the peacemaker or mediator. And they believe that to be loved and valued, you must blend in and go with the flow. So consequently, mediators, they seek harmony, they're inclusive, amiable, easygoing, comfortable and steady, but they can also be, and often are, self-forgetting, conflict avoidant and stubborn. And they are probably, uh, likely to procrastinate they regardless of what they agree to in terms of action steps in your uh, work with them uh, are are really unlikely to complete homework uh, they may ask to be held accountable and it may be very frustrating to the practitioner because they don't uh, follow through on what they say they're going to do often. And clearly because of the conflict avoidance, they may say one thing to your face and do something very, very different. So here we have the importance of creating an environment for the type nine, either if you are one or if you are treating one, for them to feel comfortable and, uh, and in knowing that this is, it, it's, it's difficult for them to make change and having structure and accountability is essential uh, and you wanna partner with them in helping them to make the changes that are necessary to move into sustaining recovery and making changes in, in other areas of their life too. And because of the conflict avoidance, if you are a type nine and you have a type that you are working with, it's very important for you as a provider, if you're a type nine, to find ways to move through your conflict avoidance. So here's a great place to interject the notion that 
we initially come into our Enneagram work with finding ways to land on type, to understand our type, and to see what our type suggests about us uh, and the strategies with which we manage life. However, the most appropriate use of the Enneagram is not to use it as a justification for who we are and what we do, but to use it as a beginning point to both stand back, cultivate personal practices of mindfulness and meditation and working with Enneagram practitioners uh, who are really knowledgeable about the Enneagram and learning to observe the self because in self-observation, we create the space to allow for change. And that's why mindfulness and meditation have become, you know, really uh, an important kind of discovery. And yet, you know, in Enneagram work, that's been a foundational um, must uh, for, for really using the Enneagram in the way that it was intended. So we'll go on to our type one, which is the last in our body center, known as the perfectionist or reformist. And they uh, believe that they must be good and right to be worthy. Consequently, perfectionists are conscientious, responsible, improvement-oriented, self-controlled, but they can also be critical, resentful, and, and self-judging. And you know, when you have somebody who's got a lot of judgment going on and um, you can only uh, see the tip of the iceberg that if the judgment that you see coming from them is just a piece of the committee that's in self-critical mode and judgment in their own head. And so this is a type where they are incredibly hard on themselves. And knowing that ahead of time, both either, you know, as a person who's rendering uh, treatment or a practitioner or those who you are working with, you know, creating the space and the practices for them to learn to lighten up with themselves or to understand that this is how they function on autopilot is absolutely crucial for client retention um, specifically. So we're gonna move on to our heart center triads, our type twos, threes, and fours, and we'll start with our type twos. Our type twos are often referred to as the giver or the helper. And the givers or helpers believe that you must give fully to others to be loved. In other, in other words, they do not feel good about themselves if they're not giving to others. And what they've lost sight of is that they need to be giving to themselves. Consequently, givers are caring, helpful, supportive, relationship-oriented, but they can also be prideful, intrusive, and demanding. And the way that um, um, this really shows up is uh, not just in, in addictions, but we see a ton of codependency here. Um, this notion of, I am indispensable to you. We see a lot of enabling here. And I just want to share with you that when I've had clients who have seen that this is the pattern that is running the show, it becomes so much easier for them to look at this universe, that universality of this um, kind of way that they move through life to begin to back off uh, with their enabling and codependency in addictive relationships. And if you are a type two and a practitioner, then knowing the clearly how to set boundaries with clients and um, when you are working harder than the client is, is, a, is a game changer. Our type threes are known as our performers. Um, they believe that you must accomplish and succeed to be loved. Consequently, performers, they're industrious, fast-paced, efficient, goal-oriented. They can also be inattentive, even though they're in the feeling triad, they can be inattentive to feelings, impatient and image driven. And the way that they deal with feelings, even though they are quite sensitive, the way that they deal with feelings is to take their feelings and see that emotions are actually going to interfere 
with their ability to get things done. So they see emotions as kind of messy and um, they, uh, the work obviously then is to uh, open the conversation and whatever experience is essential for a type three to regard the emotionality that they have access to as an information highway that would really help them to become more integrated in recovery. And unfortunately, I just have time, time for small snippets about this. I will say that uh, the clients that I have dealt with in recovery that are type threes are really fun because they really are quite competitive and they wanna do recovery really well. So they may gather a lot of days of abstinence without quality recovery because they have had no access to their emotions and then oftentimes bump up against something in a recovery that just is big and emotional and finding a way to, to partner with them and, uh, and open up the, the conversation, importance and experience of being in their emotional bodies is crucial for them to have quality recovery. Our type fours, our last uh, part of our heart-centered triad are called the romantics or individualists. They believe that you can regain the lost ideal love or perfect state by finding the love or situation that's unique, special, and fulfilling. Consequently, romantics are idealistic they have the capacity to experience intense emotions, more intense than others, to be empathic and authentic, but they can also be quite dramatic, moody, and sometimes uh, appear to be very self-absorbed. Uh, as you look at these, you may see some correlates to diagnostic criteria, and we are going to get to that um, briefly at the uh, end of the presentation today. So here uh, are romantics, um, and our individualists uh, oftentimes will leave uh, treatment because they do not feel the authenticity or the ability of their treatment provider or practitioner to hold the space for them to be all that they can be uh, emotionally. So they, like I said, they have this incredible deep capacity to, uh, to, to be in an emotional state. And the deep emotional state that they um, love being in may not necessarily just be good feelings like happiness. They may absolutely have a love affair with being sad or being lonely. There's something very romantic about all of that. Moving on to our head center triad, our types five, sixes, and sevens. The first is our type five, our observer or investigator. Observers believe that they must protect themselves from a world that demands too much and gives too little. Consequently, our observers seek self-sufficiency. They're, they're not demanding. They're quite analytic, thoughtful, and unobtrusive. They can also be withholding, detached, and overly private. Um, where this shows up oftentimes is um, you may find that they, uh, in, in working with a type five, that there are various parts of their life that they will expose over a period of time in sessions with you that you didn't find out about uh, initially. This is the, the first type that has actually had some neurobiological studies and one of the great advances in Enneagram treatment right now is that Dan Siegel, our Dr. Daniel Siegel, our expert from UCLA, that's done so much work on trauma, attachment, and neurobiology, is an Enneagram aficionado. And our type five was probably the first in the nursery to be noticed as having a neurobiological sensitivity. They generally have incredibly fine motor uh, skills and this ability to um, just uh, stand back and disengage and observe. Um, consequently, they're called the observer. Um, so, you know, 
knowing this about either yourself as a uh, practitioner or as someone that you're serving, as a client that you're serving, is absolutely huge. Um, you would certainly create a different uh, treatment plan as a counselor or a different way of assessing values and moving people forward from a counseling perspective with a type five than you would with, with any other type. And leaving room for type fives to um, set boundaries openly with you without just disengaging or removing themselves from treatment is, is another way of looking at how denial uh, or resistance might manifest itself in, in addictions, recovery, and behavioral health con other behavioral health concerns. Our head center type six, our loyal skeptic, uh, they believe that you must gain certainty and security in a hazardous world that you just can't trust. Uh, consequently, loyal skeptics are very intuitive, um, inquisitive, trustworthy, they're good friends, problem solvers, but they oftentimes are doubtful, second guessing themselves, and um, seeking safety and security uh, before they want to move forward. They have a, a, in general, this type is really, really competent, but has a sense of uh, low self-esteem or low confidence. And, you know, offering the type of support for a type six uh, when you're a practitioner engaging with a type six client is crucial, very different than you might um, want to offer support to, to any other type. Um, these types oftentimes just need a tremendous amount of reassurance. And in addition to that, a tremendous amount of reassurance that you are going to be loyal to them no matter what they bring to the table. The last type that we're going to talk about is our head center type seven, our epicure or narcissist. We don't like the term narcissist because there are, uh, we all have some narcissism and this is not necessarily the only type that's associated with a narcissistic personality disorder, as you'll see a little further in the presentation. Our epicures believe that you must stay upbeat, keep your possibilities open to ensure good life, uh, and consequently they seek pleasurable options. They're optimistic and adventurous, but they also avoid pain and can be uncommitted. I'll give you a, a charming little example of a, of a type seven. Um, Oftentimes, type sevens will go from one uh, AA meeting, if they engage in AA or NA or GA, uh, and go to several before they land at a home group. They just need to find out what, which one is going to be the best, the most fun, where they're going to, you know, find the most friendships. Um, our type sevens love positive feelings and they are just uh, lovely to be around uh, most of the time, but they will do everything they can to avoid pain and conflict and any level of negativity. So consequently, we have a really important thing uh, to learn from our type sevens, both if we are one as a practitioner and if we're serving type sevens, and that is taking them into the difficulties of life living life on life's terms, um, going into the painful situations that we have to move through and not around becomes a really important uh, treatment plan goal or a way to uh, help create action steps if you're working with a type seven uh, as a coach. So promised you some, uh, this is for our counselors on the call, promised you some assessment assistance looking at a DSM-4 correlates. As we know, some of those have changed in the DSM-5, so I'm going to refer back to the DSM-4. And so our Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Counselors uh, has a type 1 as, and these again are looking at pathology. So I really want to emphasize that the Enneagram is not a pathologically based system. Within each type, we have levels of development. 
So we are looking at the lower levels of development as we look at these DSM-4 correlates because the lower levels of development are describing pathology. So in a type one, we're looking at an obsessive compulsive disorder. And our type two, we're looking at a histrionic personality disorder or codependency. In our type threes, at lower levels of development, we're looking at hyperactivity, ADHD, and anxiety disorders, and often types, uh, oftentimes impulsivity. In fact, prior to um, the DSM-5, uh, if you were to look at the gambling disorder, which was then called, it was then labeled, uh, I think, compulsive gambling, it was categorically placed in the impulse control disorders. And oftentimes, when I first started treating gamblers 20 plus years ago, didn't quite know the Enneagram, they all were um, undiagnosed, or many, most of them were undiagnosed adults well, that had impulse control disorders. And we didn't have ADHD at that time, but um, the impulsivity was, was very prevalent. Our type fours can be correlated in a low level as a borderline or manic depressive. And certainly uh, the, the cycling aspect of that that's been uh, more recently described uh, is we see just as much depressiveness as the mania in uh, a type four. Type five in a pathological way, would look, we would look at it as a schizotypal. Type six would be a paranoid personality disorder or borderline personality, personality disorder. A type seven would be a narcissistic personality disorder or a humming low level of anxiety or some level of an anxiety disorder. A type eight uh, might be an antisocial personality disorder, a narcissistic personality disorder, or an oppositional defiant disorder. And our type nine would be a passive dependent or passive aggressive uh, personality disorder or with those kinds of characteristics. Now, I know we have flown through a tremendous amount of information uh, in this webinar, and I want to know, for those of you who would like to know more, if you would like to learn to communicate effectively, uh, more effectively with people who are different than you are, if you'd like to learn to transform character defects into character strengths for your clients and for those of you who serve others and are in recovery or have that uh, desire on your own, or who would like to learn to customize coaching and counseling for productive recovery based on type, um, there will be ongoing information. So I am wanting to um, help people overcome patterns of getting in the way of client success, teaching people how to never work harder than your clients ever again, how to better serve your client, improve client outcomes, and crack open the denial that's inherent in all addictions. So let's talk a little bit about monetizing this because you know we all have people that we've been working with for long periods of time. And one of the things when I was, I just finished my coaching uh, certification is I've learned a lot about business. And one of the things that I've learned in working with the Enneagram as a counselor and certainly now as a coach is that you can empower people to make uh, continued change, lower your own rate of burnout, get more clients by referral, and just one extra client being seen at $100 an hour for an entire year at approximately 50 sessions is is a $5,000 improvement in monetizing your own uh, ability to work with people. I do want to share with you an example of how um, kind of this worked in my own practice. So I ran addictions groups in an agency for a long period of time. And when the Enneagram, uh, when I was introduced to the Enneagram and it came into my practice, I noticed that my clients' sponsors NAA and GA were calling me and asking me what their sponsees were doing. They were saying to me things like, oh my God, my client is like flown through the steps, has done better step work as they've worked in your group than they've ever done before. 
I'm interested in working with you. Can I join my clients group with them? And it was all because they were looking at recovery through the lens of their own type. We can look at recovery as a cookie cutter kind of thing. Go to X number of meetings and X number of days. You can do your step work. You can engage with a sponsor. You can do all those things. But once you know your type, you're looking at your step work through the lens of type. You're engaging with people in different ways. You might find that even though you don't absolutely love the 12 steps as they're offered through what some people call a lens of religiosity or spiritual, uh, a spiritual um, lens that they might want to be involved in smart recovery, but the importance of community and not doing it by themselves becomes absolutely crucial. So the good news is that if you would like to join a weekly coaching group, um, I'm going to be starting one from August 16th through August 18th. It's going to be run for 10 weeks. It's an interactive training. It will be conducted by Zoom so that you can better understand each of the nine types in recovery. And to go along with these, um, these webinars, these 10 weeks of webinars and group coaching, you will also receive uh, nine interviews. Each of the interviews has treatment planning information and is about an hour long and has all sorts of um, just pearls of nuggets. You will be professionally guided in this small group setting. The, the group will be limited to a certain number. I will be facilitating that and until um, July 4th, Although the value is $1,000, I will be offering this course for $750. And as a bonus, um, you will be offered a one-hour private session uh, with me at the beginning or at the end of the um, training. And I would certainly suggest you either do it midway or at the end for how to incorporate this information and integrate it into your practice. And here is the URL where you can sign up. And then, if you want to do it yourself, the Nine Paths of Recovery has a self-study program where you can actually purchase those um, interviews, as I told you, and you can, you can purchase them and study on your own, uh, looking at the interviews with all of the information associated with them. Each one of these interviews has both a process addiction and a substance addiction. So each type, types one through nine are in recovery from both a substance use disorder and a gambling disorder and they've all answered the same four questions the questions are how do you know that you're that type second question is what aspects of that type contributed to the demise in your addiction the third question they answer is what aspects of that type have assisted you with resilience in your recovery? And the fourth question of each type is, if you met someone or were talking to someone who identified with your type, what would you want them to know about your type that you think would assist them in the recovery process? And the, um, uh, this offer is 199 through July 4th. After July 4th, it will go up to $250. You can also purchase this, the same URL below. And you can upgrade if you uh, buy the um, um, interviews and decide you wanna join the coaching group, you can certainly upgrade um, once you've started to look at them if you decide you wanna join our coaching group. So I think, um, that's it, and we're gonna go to our Q&A. And we should have about 15 minutes to answer as many questions as we can. So I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Kathy.
Hmm. Kathy, I am not able to. Kathy, can you hear me? I uh, can't hear. Hmm. Let's see. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yay, I can hear you now. Okay, wonderful. So, um, if anyone has any questions after that great presentation from Renee, you can go ahead and use that chat box at the bottom of your screen and put your question in there and Renee will answer as many of those as she can. So, go ahead. No one has any questions, Renee? That's really hard to believe. <laughs> I know. I think they, yeah, you did such a great job. Okay, Renee, here's a question for you. In your groups, will you be talking about the interaction of types? Um, we will be talking about uh, not only the interaction of types, but we'll be talking about the the way that each type not only engages in recovery and may have some difficulties with others in recovery, but we also, based on the um, um, uh, type of the practitioner, will be paying attention to the bias the practitioner brings into that interaction as well. Okay, thank you. So we have another question. Um, how do you move a number four who is romantic about depression? Well, I'm going to suggest that um, the most important thing is the practice of self-awareness. You know, in any of the types, the ability for them to understand what's running the show and what their default mechanisms are and where that both serves them and is a challenge in relationship is what it takes for people to want to, um, any type, to want to do things differently because the pain point or what's getting in the way is the motivation for someone to make change. Now that being said, one of the things that type fours will learn about themselves is they are the most likely type to ask for lots and lots of information from other people, opinions from other people, and have a hard time uh, changing uh, behaviors because they, because of this automatic response to kind of stay stuck. There's something romantic about staying stuck. So the self-awareness piece is teaching type fours about the romanticizing of staying stuck and in the discomfort. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, and, and, and remember also if there's um, any further questions, you need to type in an email Renee. She's at Renee at you are your potential. Dot com. I'll put that email in the chat box in just a moment. So Renee, another question. What level of attention would I get in the group coaching? You'll get a great level of attention because we're closing the coaching group off at 25. So, um, and that, and they, the recordings will be available uh, afterwards. My hunch is not everybody will be available live. The group coaching uh, is for, um, it will probably be a two hour group. Uh, and so I think that everybody will get uh, a, um, a great deal of individual assistance in addition to the fact that as a bonus, like I said, for those people who sign up for the group coaching, um, you'll get an, an hour of my individual attention to talk about how to bring that into your practice. Great. Thanks, Renee. Um, here's another question for you. Are some types more addiction prone for certain substances. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. And so without going through all the types, I will share with you that um, 
alcohol is an equal opportunity uh, type issue when it's it's the only substance where we don't really see a, a tendency for one type to have more of a problem with alcohol than others but as you can uh, as we consider types I'll just give a couple of examples uh, type nines are generally not uh, likely to love amphetamines because they really value being peaceful and easygoing, so they really don't love amphetamines. Uh, type eights love amphetamines, type sevens love amphetamines, so you see a lot of cocaine, methamphetamine, methamphetamine addiction in uh, types eights and sevens. See a ton of codependency in types twos and nines. Um, like I said, we could we could go on and on, but I, we'll go into that in the, the training. We'll have a lot of information about what addictions are most likely to show up in what types. Thank you. So one more question. I have used the Enneagram for years. How specific do you get in regard to behavior, recovery, and communication with the types? very specific we talk about um the behaviors that are um are are patterned we talk about the the thoughts that are patterned by different types we talk about the feelings that are patterned by different types and we talk about the reactivity or behaviors that are patterned by certain types and then we talk about specific um in engagement in recovery. So for instance, uh, in terms of the recovery, um, asking uh, um, a, a type seven to choose a meeting and stick with that particular meeting is, is just not gonna happen. If you ask a type nine to do 90 meetings in 90 days, they might tell you because that's kind of a cookie cutter uh, treatment planning goal uh, for, for uh, addictions recovery. Getting a type nine to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, it's not gonna happen. Uh, getting a type nine to engage in exercise as part of a recovery, that's gonna take a lot of work. That's not gonna happen right off the top. Getting a type two to, um, to really focus on themselves and not be really helpful. I mean, doing service work for everybody else in recovery for a type two is probably not the best thing for a type two to be doing. So, you know, you start seeing some of these things that are kind of cookie cutter ways that we've been dealing with addictions treatment. And the more we know about the people that we're serving, the more likely we are to really, really engage them in ways that will help move them forward in the recovery process to sustain meaningful recovery. Thank you very much. So um, if anyone has any other questions, now is your time. Otherwise, um, I think we're to the end of the question. So, Renee, I'll turn it back over to you. So, as I just want to express my gratitude, it has been um, really, really important for me. And this is my passion to bring the Enneagram into the world in meaningful ways. And I would like to end by just uh, suggesting that for anybody who, who wants more information, please feel free uh, to email me. I absolutely love talking about the Enneagram in many ways, but because I've been working with it in the addictions community and it is such an underutilized tool, um, this is, this is of, of utmost importance. I just think it's, it's been a game changer. It's shortened the length of, of client stay and it's encouraged other clients to come into treatment and it's been really, really empowering. And the biggest issue of all is I will tell you that um, I have learned more about myself as a treatment provider than through any other way. I mean, transference and counter-transference and personality assessments and counseling and coaching I've done in the past, none of it has led me to the level of self-awareness that I have uh, as much as my Enneagram studies. And I would also like to thank you, uh, Kathy, for helping me through the technical issues and for all of you in in terms of, of of watching this webinar thank you thank you okay one more question oh. um will, will this recording be available on your website um yes it will yes it will be okay <laughs> and we will send everyone the link 
to that recording. Very good. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Thank you, Renee. Okay, bye -bye. Renee, you need to, you need to, bye-bye, you need to click on end meeting for all. Thanks, okay. Renee. Renee?